guys. Oh, <laughs> it's great to see you all. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm excited to be with you guys tonight, uh, continuing going through James. Uh, but we have a song for you guys. Uh, it's a great song. It's a really fun song. And uh, we want to invite you guys to uh, stand with us and sing this song out to the Lord. Desperate for help You know what it's like to be tired And only a shell of yourself Well you start to believe You don't have what it takes Cause it's all you can do just to move Much less finish the race But don't forget everybody out here tonight for our Bible study as we're studying the book of James. And so uh, we uh, are closing out this study here in a few weeks that we've been involved in since January the 26th. So we've been in the book of James for quite a long time. And um, I'm glad for those of you that have been able to be a part of this. I, I've shared with the church before, this is uh, 
Uh, the first book of the Bible I ever memorized uh, as a sophomore in high school. We were challenged to take these five chapters and, and memorize them as young people and to put them in our minds and our hearts. And so for almost 40 years now, I've been involved in this book. And I think this will probably be the last time I ever teach it, at least in our ministry here. I've taught it a few other times, but, uh, you know, as uh, they're singing a song, I'm kind of in that leg of my life of ministry where we kind of look at that uh, there's still a lot more to do, but you're kind of at that last leg. You wonder, you know, if we were to start teaching now uh, all the things that we've taught since the beginning of this church some 20, 22 years ago, I'd be well probably past the time to be in ministry. So I'm uh, trying to make the most of this study and help you all out with uh, this book of James that I thoroughly uh, enjoy in my personal life and I've enjoyed teaching uh, to you all. So uh, they're passing out the outlines tonight. This is something, again, uh, you can use it. You can fill it out if you want. If you have no interest in doing that, it's not going to hurt my feelings at all. Uh, but um, this is for you. The goal here is to help people uh, with these outlines to become familiar with the book of the Bible so that you can find yourself in God's Word, learning His truths, principles, and gaining uh, you know, um, great information, grace for your life, and your walk with the Lord hopefully will be closer. But uh, we're going to be looking at James chapter 5. We've got a specific passage of scripture here we'll be looking at, and I think you'll enjoy. Uh, we had a great, great Sunday service. I mean, fantastic. Grad service. Uh, Delaney, you did an amazing job sharing uh, a challenge with the uh, graduates. Uh, Beth, again, just a wonderful, wonderful work you're doing with our teenagers and uh, your vision to keep them, uh, you know, close together, close to the Lord, a lot of activities. They have Matt, this week, uh, they've got a, uh, a youth retreat plan for this summer, and so they're working on that and um, other activities that are taking place, but uh, they do so much, and so they've put so much into these young people, and we thank God for them. And then, of course, Vanita was baptized on Sunday, and that was fantastic. Let's give her a big hand. And matter of fact, as I stand here and look, if I could get one of the guys to cover this baptistry, we didn't cover it on Sunday. And then a second thing I'm going to need, I don't know if they did it or not, but our flag should be flying half-mask, is it? Does anybody know if that flag is flying half-mask or not? Obviously, it is not. If the big farmer in the back could get up and go do that, there you go. Um, then, oh, I meant David Strong. Did I say big farmer? He's not a farmer. He's, I don't know what he is. He's, uh, but he's going to go change that flag, and so we'll get that going. And uh, if somebody could remember at the end of the service to do this, uh, I'd appreciate it. We... Um, just we don't have a whole lot to share with you tonight in terms of our activities. We always have so much going on, but it feels like as we're closing out this final week of school for our, for our students, um, not a whole lot going on this week, and especially with um, guys, you'll have to help me, not advancing. Is there something wrong? Can somebody advance it? Please help me not look <laughs> stupid. On um, There it is. Um, this Friday, our game, it's, uh, we're, we have a bye week. We've had two games already canceled. Uh, due to rain. This week is not canceled due to rain. It's just because on the schedule we have the bye. So there isn't a game uh, this Friday night, but there will be one the following Friday. And I think that's uh, June, what, 3rd? And it's at 9.15. 9:15. So we'll have another slide for that later on. But got a week off, uh, and so enjoy Friday night. And then this is the last time I'll show it. For those of you that ordered the jerseys and you've not yet picked yours up or paid for it, they're in the back. And I think, Pam, are there a couple left? There's two left, so I'm not sure who they are. We won't announce that here, but please, if you've not got your jerseys, do that. And then uh, we would remind you, again, guys, it's not... I got lots of this. See? See this, guys? I have this. Everybody see this? This works. There we go. Memorial, Memorial Day. And, uh, you know, uh, Memorial Day is always a special weekend to uh, honor those who have sacrificed and given their ultimate price for our freedom. Uh, by serving this country in the military, we always recognize uh, those folks and the families who remain behind to remember their loved ones. And uh, at the same time, we have current events that are happening right now that I think we need to uh, be very, very prayerful about. And so uh, uh, Memorial Day will be this uh, Sunday. We normally have a, uh, a grill out after church, but we've had so much going on, we're just going to kind of take a break. We have a number of things that we've been doing. Uh, one of the things I'm trying to finish and get going here is that our fellowship hall, we're going to have to uh, 
do some renovating back there in order to open up for more classroom space for the number of folks that are coming here to church on Sundays. And so I've got a few companies I've been talking to, and we're hoping to get them in here and, and get, uh, get those areas kind of separated so that we can put classes back. That's a good problem, amen? And so we're thankful for that. But uh, here tonight, here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at James, and hopefully I can go through these slides and keep my, uh, and keep my thoughts together. And we're going to talk again, James chapter 5, about this, the topic of prayer, because this is how James closes out, um, uh, closes out this book. But before we do, let's open up in a word of prayer, okay? Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this great privilege to be alive with our families and our church, especially when this nation is mourning another horrific, terrible tragedy of a school shooting. And this is something that we can't even wrap our, our brains around, of the great wickedness that's in our culture. And Lord, we are just brokenhearted, and we talk about praying, but we know that there needs to be more than just prayers. Prayer's important, but Lord, we must see some type of action and change in this country, in this nation, if it will survive. And we pray for each and every family that is overwhelmed with grief and broken hearts, moms and dads, brothers and sisters, aunt and uncles, grandparents, that are there in Texas and probably all over the nation, families, extended families that are unable to even process what has happened to them in the past 24, 48 hours. God, our hearts go out to them. But we cry out to you, O oh God. We know that this nation has said enough about prayer. And at some point, this nation needs to have a time of repentance from the top to the bottom. And may it start in your house, even here at Buckeye Baptist Church. It's our responsibility as believers to stay clean and close to you, to follow you, to not live lives that are lies, but to be authentic and real. Help us, dear God, not to be the reason that you've had to remove your hand from homes and families and churches. May we continue to see a growth and a revival that can take place. I have hope, Lord. I have hope for, for individuals and homes and communities. And there's even a little bit of hope for this nation, but it's very small. I ask you to open up our hearts tonight. This is a privilege to be here. There are people right now that would love to be in our shoes and so, God, may we make the most of this opportunity that you've ordained to be in your word and to learn something that was going to help us to endure to the very end. And we thank you and pray it in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. For those of you that are visiting, uh, if you are visiting, you haven't been around a whole lot, we have been doing this study for quite a while now. In this study from day one, I have tried to show everyone and give you a theme and a characteristic. Well, first of all, I've given you a characteristic of each chapter. James is a book of action. James is a book that talks about how what you believe affects how you behave. And you need to get that in your head as a believer. If uh, you call on Christ as your Savior and you've done that and the Holy Spirit's coming to you and you've experienced the power of, uh, of Christ in the resurrection, and you've experienced the miracle of regeneration, the Bible says he makes all things new. You're a new creature. And old things are passed away and all things become new. And James is, a, is really a prophet in the New Testament. He kind of thunders these lessons. and there's, There is tenderness here, and there's direction here, but he is making it clear to believers that your behavior matters, that your behavior doesn't save you, but your, your salvation is proved through the change that Christ makes in you, and your behavior should change. And with each one of these chapters, you find... A characteristic, James is not talking to lost people. I'm not even sure he's talking to carnal people. But it's as if he's got gathered around him some serious-minded Christians, people that really are truly wanting to be disciples of Jesus Christ. And he gives the characteristics from each chapter. Now, I'm not going to go through all five of these because I've done it so many times. But tonight in chapter 5, 
The one characteristic that James makes clear that a mature believer has in their life, and you need to ask yourself, are you a mature believer then? Is that they are prayerful in times of trouble. Actually, they pray all the times. And this isn't some self-righteous type of fake praying. These are people broken before God, talking to him throughout the day, in the morning, in the afternoon, in the night. They're not folding their hands, posturing in prayer somewhere, having just a little public prayer. They, they are talking to the Lord. They're growing and they're doing it at all times and especially in times of trouble. And I guess to say it this way, sure, we can see that in the past 24 hours, I've heard more about prayer than just about anything. I've heard people say, let's pray for peace, pray for the community, pray for the nurses, pray for the doctors, pray for law enforcement, pray for teachers, pray for communities, pray for the school, and pray for the nation. And it seems like that when there's times of trouble and tragedy, people pray. So it would seem a strange thing to say that mature believers pray in times of trouble because, let's be honest, most people pray when there's trouble and so that's not really hard. But I guess one of the questions and what James is dealing with here, and I pose the question this way, when do you pray? And I bet if we were honest with ourselves and I asked myself this question, when do I pray? You know when I normally pray? When I feel like it. That's kind of when I pray. When do you pray? When I feel like it. Well, how often is that? Not a whole lot of times I feel like praying. Well, when there's trouble, I feel like praying. When I get overwhelmed, I feel like praying. I allow those things, difficulties, things are bad. You've heard of people that have mood swings. We kind of have prayer swings. People will pray when it's bad, but when it's good, people tend to not pray. They tend not to talk to the Lord anymore. They tend to, you know, things are good. What do I need to talk to him for? What do I need that? So the mature believer prays, yes, during times of trouble, but a mature, mature believer prays all the time. And so when we think about <clears throat> praying when times are bad, not praying when times are good, you got to be careful. You want to know why? Because if you pray that way, kind of like a mood swing prayer, you're going to find that not only do you not pray when things are good, you're going to find you to stop praying when things are bad too. And you will find that you're not talking to God at all. Now, <clears throat> James, in James chapter 5, and let me read this to you so that you can get the, the flow of this. Starting in verse 13, and we've already covered verse 1 all the way to verse 12 and did two lessons on that. When we come to verse 13, here's the question. Is any among you afflicted? We'll talk about this in a moment. What does it mean to be afflicted? Who was he talking to? Is any among you afflicted? Then he says, let him pray. Is any among you merry? Let him sing psalms. And then it says in verse number 14, is any among you sick? Well, then if you are, let them call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And then it says in verse number 15, that the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up and, he hath, and if he's committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. And I had to stop there. I had to stop there because there's a, I thought tonight I would, I would go almost all the way to verse 18, but I thought I can't do that. There's too much to cover. And so I want to get to that. So here's what I want to say. There are here four situations that James shares with us that describes times that we should pray. Matter of fact, I will have to read the rest of the scripture, so let's go back. I'm sorry. I want to go verse 16 to verse 18. There's a reason why I did this, and I'll tell you in a minute. He goes on and says in verse 16, Confess your faults one to another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. Why? Because the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elias was a man also subject to like passions as we are, and yet he prayed. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Now, why did I do that? Because every single verse... 
From verse 13 to verse 13, every single verse the word prayer or pray is mentioned. That's why this is a section on prayer. I don't have to make it up. I just interpret the scriptures. Matter of fact, look back at verse 13. It says, is any among you afflicted? Let him, what's the word? Pray. Verse 14, is any of you sick? Let them call for the elders. And what? Let them pray over him. Verse 15, it talks about the prayer of faith. Verse 16, pray for one another. Verse 17, Elias prayed. Verse 18, he prayed again. So we see prayer, 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 prayer. And he gives these situations in which people need to pray. What are the situations that he talks about? Well, the first thing he talks about is that we are to pray in times of suffering. So that's the first thing I want you to fill in. We are to pray in times of suffering. Got it? Pray when there's bad times. Pray when there's trouble. The second thing he says is you should also pray in days of sickness. Most of the time, if I were to say right now, hey, let's take up prayer requests, I guarantee I'd stand here for 10 minutes and listen to a medical report. We would talk about everybody who's sick and everything that's wrong with an individual. We normally pray in times of sickness. We normally pray in times of suffering. A third time, he says, is this. We are to pray for a nation when it's hurting. And folks, this nation is hurting right now, isn't it? Some of it's hurting. The other half is already dead, and I mean emotionally dead, spiritually dead. Something's wrong with this sick nation. It's already rotted, and it's, and it's as if leprosy. You know, in leprosy, and the Bible used leprosy to describe what sin's like, one of the things that leprosy does, it makes you numb. And sin makes people numb, emotionless, to what kind of happens around them. But we are to pray when a nation is hurting. And then the, th the fourth and final says, thing he talks about doing, he says, we are to pray for fallen Christians, defeated Christians, struggling Christians, backslidden Christians. There's a time to pray for them. Now, this isn't an all-inclusive prayer list, by the way, of situations. There are many reasons to pray. I'm just telling you the, the situations James brings in to this passage of Scripture. Four reasons. Now, here's what's interesting about all four of these situations. For every situation that James shares with us that we should pray, he pairs that with a divine resource of God that can be acquired when we go to God in these situations. You with me? With every situation, he, he pairs that situation with a grace of God, a, a divine resource of God that can be accessed only when you go to God in prayer. And what are those? Well, the first one is this, for suffering, when you're in prayer and you're, when you're going through times of suffering and you go to God in prayer, the Bible says there is a divine, and when I say divine, it means it's a spiritual commodity and there's only one place you can get it. You can only get this comfort that comes from God. This is why, young people, in marriage, why it's so important that believers marry other believers. You say, well, why? Because, first of all, there's no fellowship with light and dark. Okay? There's no fellowship with light and dark. But you need to understand that when you are in marriage, in general, you know what people always think? That person that I fall in love with, their love's going to make me whole. No, it won't. That person's forgiveness is going to make me whole. No, it won't. And you can attribute everything you think to a spouse that you think is going to make you whole. And what you don't realize, there are some things in your life, no spouse, no matter how faithful, no matter how godly, no matter what they are in your life, they can never fill the space that only God can. And some of you have deep hurts, broken hearts, pains, things that you've come uh, in contact with that has broken you, you do need comfort. But your pastor can't give it to you, a psychiatrist can't give it to you, your parents can't give it to you, and your spouse can't give it to you. The only one who can give it to you is God because it's a spiritual commodity and it only comes from God. But the great thing is it does come from God and it'll come from God in times of prayer. Amen? And James is pairing these things together. For, so, so no wonder so many people today have no peace. They have no comfort. They have religion, but they don't have comfort. 
They have a church, but they don't have God. You don't have a working relationship with God. You're just faking it here tonight. And you need a little encouragement to say, stop faking it. Because the pains and the suffering you're going through, only our God can comfort you. And praise God for that. That doesn't mean you cannot receive comfort from your spouse, from your parents, from your pastor, from other people. But I'm telling you, biblically, there are some things that only the comfort of God can, can it's only his comfort that's going to help it and heal you. Got it? This is to help you. Because so many people, keep going to the same empty well. It's like the woman at the well. She kept going to the same place day after day, day after day, and she would continue to thirst, continue to thirst, continue to thirst because she wasn't drinking from the well of Jesus Christ when he looked at her and said, let me tell you something, honey. You you drink of me, you're never going to thirst again. I got something that this world can't even touch. Comfort that comes from God. Not only this, For sickness, the Bible talks about restoration. And I can tell you there have been times that I have literally witnessed people restored. I want to make it crystal clear to you, and I'll do it in the next message. This is not what these movements today are doing with this great, all this name it and claim it healing stuff that he's talking about. Matter of fact, I know that we we pray this way at this church, and I have seen people restored that only God could do it. But I'm telling you, this verse really actually isn't even talking about a physical disease that people are dealing with. It's talking about worn up, beat up Christian people. And it's this disease that's described very strangely here. But anyway, we'll talk about that next week. And then the other thing he pairs up for the hurting nation, he doesn't ask for anything, he mentions fellowship. There is a fellowship. You know the first thing I heard from a senator's mouth this morning when I woke up to find out how is the nation responding from this. You know what she said? She said, oh, God, help us to love our neighbor as ourselves. We've lost it in this nation. Some point, we're going to have to bring God back into the country. And the first commandment of God is love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind. Get your relationship right with God first. Amen? Amen. Do you know that if somebody had a bus ministry in that town and had maybe knocked on the door of that 18-year-old teenager and invited him to church and he had accepted Christ as his Savior, do you know that kid would have never walked in that school and done that? Do you know that? You say, can you prove that? I sure can. Look at verse number 20. What's verse 20 say? Let him know that he which converts the sinner from the error of his way, he'll save a soul from death and hide a multitude of sins. Amen? There could be 21 people alive today if maybe someone had led that guy to Jesus Christ earlier on in his life. Amen? And I mean a real, not a religious experience. Because let me tell you, wackos go to church. Religious people are the craziest people I've ever met on this planet. People that think they're God, hear God, see God, do things for God, hear the voices of demons. They're scary people. And completely cut off from the reality of the Bible and what God has to say. I'm talking about a person like Saul, who he went around killing people for a living, And then on the Damascus Road, he met the Savior. Amen. And guess what happened? Through his conversion, a multitude of lives were preserved because he stopped murdering people. And he started sharing Jesus Christ with people. And people got saved. See, friends, I'm telling you, these things are related. We need to be about the Father's business. Amen. And let me tell you something in a nation that's hurting. It needs fellowship. You say, what kind of fellowship? The kind of fellowship where we look over at our neighbor and we don't lust after their their spouse. We don't lust after their cars. We don't wish them harm and wickedness. I want to steal what you have. Friend, when you apply the principles of the Word of God, you look at your neighbor and the Bible says the second commandment is you love your neighbor as you love yourself. And you do good to them. And you help preserve what they have. 
You don't think about robbing them, stealing from them, lying to them, manipulating them. My God, if we had a nation of government leaders that would stand up and stop lying to us to steal the money from this nation and to, to twist their wicked, sinful ways into some policy to manipulate people, this would be a safer place. But it's not safe. We see it in our leaders, but we see it all the way down to our neighborhoods and our communities. Oh, he says, I got something in prayer. You know why people will gather around flagpoles? How many of you kids have done that? You gather around a flagpole. Let me see your hands. I would say almost every one of these kids, and even over here some adults, where it's as if once a year somebody says, let's gather around a flagpole and pray for our nation. That's a good thing, amen? That's a biblical thing. We may not agree on everything biblically, theologically, but friends, i got no problem with holding the hand of an atheist. If they want to gather around the flagpole with me and we pray for this nation, I'll take you by your hand. Amen? Not divide up our nation. All these different, putting your people in front of Christ. Don't put your people in front of Christ. We are followers of Jesus Christ. And we're to love one another. Amen? Don't hate your neighbor. This country's so messed up. You know, I was sharing with somebody this week. I, I said, you know, it's funny. that such a messed up country of ours and culture of ours. It's almost become like one of those tribes. I mean, if I talk about biblical things, here's what it sounds like to some of your ears. Let's say you grow up in a, in a, in a culture, and this is real. There are people that grow up in cultures like this that believe the highest good and the most valuable thing you can do is eat your neighbor. That's what headhunters do. And there's tribes out there. You take a person's head in another village, you capture their soul, and it's the greatest, and they would honor you. And then there's a culture over here that doesn't say eat your neighbor. There's a culture over here that says love your neighbor. How foreign that would be to that group of headhunters. Love your neighbor. What are you talking about? They've called evil good. And good, evil. Well, friends, what's happened in this country that I as a pastor and you as a Christian are most hated for calling what God calls light and good and following this? They would call me all types of things, call you the same thing. You are hated. You're just as hated as those two cultures that are polar opposite. There's something wrong, and it's spiritual. Men have forgotten God, and that's why these things happen. Ju Judges ends the whole book by saying, In that day there was no king in Israel, and every man did that which was right in their own eyes. And that's how we raise people today. today you do what's right in your eyes. So if somebody thinks it's right in their eyes to go in and do the horrific things that happen that we've seen in this nation and will happen and see it again and again and again and again and again. Truth of the matter is what people don't understand about the Constitution of the United States, this thing only works amongst the Christians. It can only work by people who fear God. There is no fear of God before their eyes. People don't fear God before their eyes are dangerous people to let them be free. You free the criminals from the prison systems, that's dangerous. They don't deserve freedom. And friend, this nation enjoys such great freedoms, and with it, it comes responsible. I read a thing this week that said this, and it's so true. Christianity does not need America. Christianity has been on this planet for 2,000 years with cultures all over this planet. Christianity does not need America, but America needs Christianity. Amen? Amen? And it does need Christianity. And it's proof today that America needs you to be just what you're doing tonight. Amen? Your neighborhoods need you to be here. Your you say, we're in the Word of God. In prayer. In prayer for your neighbors, for your schools, for your government leaders. Who else is going to pray for these people? There's going to be crowns in heaven for those of you that have the courage to get on your knees and love your neighbors and love your enemies. 
pray for your government leaders, not because you like them and agree with them. You got to cut that out. You got to cut this out. I'm going to pray for the people I like, and I'm not going to pray for the people I don't like. Pray for everybody, amen? You're an ambassador of Jesus Christ. Identify with him, and let's be the church, amen? amen. Now, I got on a soapbox, didn't I? What's the fourth thing, the last one? For the defeated Christian, there is a spiritual commodity, and it's called power. And we'll get a little bit into this a little bit while, a uh, little bit here in a minute. Now, I want to say something. Do you all remember? So what we're doing, we're closing out the book of James. And if you remember from the very start, I gave a key verse that I thought was key for the entire chapter, the entire, the entire book. Does anybody remember what that key verse is? James chapter 1, verse number 4, and what does it say? But let patience have her perfect work that you may be perfect and entire. What? Wanting, lacking, nothing. Now I say that because the key to that verse is that God, through each one of these chapters, is imploring us. to seek out the spiritual commodity of patience. But I want to say the word patience very differently because this is more accurate than our English word, patient. And it's the word endurance. And I want you to understand this because what I'm going to talk about next is going to apply so much to this. You need to know that prayer is the heart of patience. It is the heart of endurance. It is the heart. It is the core. It is everything to keep us from quitting, from throwing in the towel, from staying, from doing what we need to do. Listen, hostility was aimed at these Christians. The Christian environment is the sea. It's rough. It's like waves are crashing all the time. It never rests. That's your environment. And hostility is to be expected in the Christian life. Tremendous, stressful situations await you. The Bible said in chapter 1, be patient in trials. It told us that under persecution, you're going to face persecution from an anti-Christian culture. They faced it. It told us that we would be faced with worldly temptations and lust that would draw us away from God. That you would have great trouble from the outside, terrible pressure on the inside. That you're going to live in a world that's constantly angry at you. Do you live that life yet? I do. I do. I've pastored this church for 22 years. And from a moment of go, There's not been a day someone has not been angry at me. We've watched these messages. I told someone today, I keep re-watching. If if I were to let you to listen to my pastor, Dr. Ronald Schaefer, I should do it sometime. Most of you probably wouldn't listen for five minutes. Yeah, I'm out of here. I ain't going to take that. I could let you listen to Dr. Howard Sears. You'd say, I ain't going to listen to that. I could let you listen to Curtis Hudson. I have these messages in my office. He said, I'm not going to listen to that. You, you, you could listen to Jerry Johnson. You say, I ain't going to listen to that. People get angry, get angry, angry, angry. You know all those men were persecuted? I'm talking about men I know. Do you know that I know that some of you, since I met you as a Christian, you know, I would love to be able to say you accept Christ as your Savior, your problems go away. They don't. Oftentimes they increase. You know, some of you, I've known you a long time too. And I would say this, from the time I've known you, I pretty much don't know a time somebody wasn't angry at you. That somebody's not offended. That somebody's not mad. I, I don't know why it's this way. But it feels like James is trying to encourage these people that are Jews living in a Gentile culture and people are angry with him. And James is saying, guys, stay faithful. Don't waver. waver. Don't be a double-minded man. Look for the crown of life. James 1, let patience have her perfect work. Endurance is the heart, or I'm sorry, prayer is the heart. The only way you're going to make it is you're going to have to learn to pray, 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 pray. And you say, why pray? 
Because in prayer, you are relying on the divine resources that James just listed for us. And you need every one of them just to have staying power. Now, friend, I could tell you that the first book of the Bible I ever memorized was the book of James, which that's true because I love that book and was challenged. My other favorite book in the Bible is the book of Psalms. You know, I was looking at Psalms. I've done this before, and it's amazing to me. I love the Psalms. I love the Psalms because the Psalms is what we call the Hebrew hymn book. The Psalms have in it scriptures given by God for every single human emotion that we could possibly experience. Every mood you would have, there's a psalm for it. Every mood. Dr. Jerry Vines calls the Psalms the medicine cabinet for the human heart. The medicine cabinet for the human heart, for your emotions, for your emotions. So if you're angry, sad, depressed, whatever it is, there's a psalm that ministers to that emotion that you would face. I have found that to be true. I have also found that the Psalms, there's 150 of them. I'll give you 10 right in a row from Psalm number, well, not to Psalms 1, but from Psalms 2 to Psalms 10. Every single Psalm that you read, it is a person who is, who is crying a prayer from their heart for something for their heart because of their moods. Now, I want to ask you a question. When do you pray? When I feel like it. So hopefully you're in the right mood, is what we would say. Well, that's going to be a problem if you're waiting to be in the right mood, because you may never pray at all. But when we look at this, we see the heart of the Psalms is prayer. Prayer for endurance, prayer for keep going, prayer for staying power. Psalms 2, in prayer, he said, why do the heathen rage at me? And Psalms 3 said, Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Psalms 4, hear me, O God, when I cry. Psalms 5, give ear to my words, O God. Psalms 6, my soul is sore vexed. Psalm 7, save me from all those that persecute me. Psalm 8, what is a man that you're mindful of him? Psalm 9, oh, have mercy on me, O God, and consider my trouble which I suffer of them that, what, hate me. Psalms 10, why, O oh God, do you stand afar off? O oh Lord, why do you hide yourself from me in times of trouble? You ever feel that way? And you know what I find from the Psalms? That in spite of feeling like God wasn't even listening, they still prayed. Prayers for the heart, from the heart. Let me tell you, James tells us how hard it is to pray, and to pray at all times comes from a mature Christian. And it's difficult to pray. I get it. It's difficult to pray when you're experiencing certain emotional hang-ups. Your emotions might say this, I am beyond the ability for God to help me. Or they are beyond the ability for God to help them. Or the circumstances that I'm in will never change. That's a mood that you're in, and none of those are true. Let me give you this Bible fact. You need to understand this and write it down. There is not one mood on this planet beyond the grace and ability of God to help you. Amen? Not one. Whatever kind of day you're having, you need to know that God can absolutely give you strength, comfort, restoration, fellowship, and power to what? To endure. John Calvin said, there is no time which God does not invite us to him. You need to understand as a Christian, your life isn't any different than anybody else's lives. I don't know why we get hung up on this idea. You know what your life is like everybody else's, and what is that? You got good days, you got bad days. You got mountaintops, you got valleys. You're up, you're down. That doesn't change because you get saved. A lot of Christians get upset because you're having a bad day. Well, in a bad time. Well, I'm not in the mood to pray. I'm not in the mood to go to church. I'm not in the mood to serve. I'm not in the mood. I'm not in the mood. That's an immature believer. No wonder so many people quit. Give up on God. we got to be mature. Grow. There's great benefits from that. Look at what he says. Now, James is going to give us three moods. i got to go through these quick. What are the three moods James gives? The first mood is he says, those that are afflicted. Is any among you what? Afflicted. Anybody around here afflicted? And you know what? He almost says this sarcastically because if you've studied James up to this point, you know that every single person he's talking to is suffering. 
And I mean, they are suffering big time. So it's as if he's like, anybody suffering? Seriously? You seriously asking us that, James? He knew the answer. Then he asked this question. Was any of you merry or cheerful? That's the second mood. Anybody happy? There may have been a few people. And let me say something about trouble. You know, when trouble comes, sometimes trouble comes to you and other people, happiness comes to them. It's just the way life works out. Some days you say this is the darkest day of my life, and another day somebody's proposed to some girl and made her the happiest person on the planet. Happens on the same day. So he asked the question, any of you merry or cheerful? And then the third scene, he says, hey, I got a question. Anybody here sick? This is this. I mean, it means you don't, you are, you are pounded to dust. That, that you are almost sick from the burden that you carry. So much so that here, stay on that page. Because here's what I'm going to do for next week. For the, for the mood, here's what he says. I know I didn't get it. What he say? Is keep, go, flip back to the page where you put afflicted. And right next to it, because for that mood, for that mood, he gives us a challenge. And he says, for those of you that are afflicted, what are you to do? Individually pray. Individual prayer. It's your responsibility. You take your burden to God in prayer. Got it? You pray. Let him pray. Let her pray. You pray. Are you afflicted and suffering? Then you pray. You go to God. Second thing, he says this. He says, is any Mary? And it's not just individual prayer, but it's individual praise. We have a responsibility to say, praise God. That's your responsibility. Well, we have a worship team here. They try to lead you in praise. It would be a big help, and I'm sure they would all nod their heads if they would say, Pastor, could you please ask the church, to have the people praise God because they try so hard and people still stand there. Oh, no. I can't sing this song. It's not ACDC. It's never going to be ACDC either. You do know where you're at, right? Not in the mood. It's very difficult to stand up here. You know this. Let me tell you, I think lately the church is starting to worship a little more. Because you know what you're finding? you got some stuff to thank God for. Amen? But it's tough to stand here, teach God's word, people looking through, counting the bricks back there. Some of you know how many bricks, and you even have names for them. Oh, no, I should have never said that. Now some of you are going to do it. Aaron, is she in here? Aaron. Oh. But you know what? Your praise should be to him. And then the third thing, it's like, you know what he says? He says, is anybody sick? This has to do with corporate prayer. You know, there are some times, hey, we need help, right? You need help. You need other people praying for you. It's as, if, it's as if I can't even pray myself. I need help. We oftentimes do have this happen when people have a physical ailment. They'll come to the church and the leaders, and we will take them in my office, and we will pray for them, and they are overwhelmed. So there's a time of corporate prayer. Certainly that's needed. Next week, I'm going to talk a lot more about this. So here's what I want to talk to you. God is available. What for any mood? Now, the thing I want to talk to you about, on the, is this on the back side now? You can flip it over. I want to talk about enduring to the end. And there's only two thoughts here about it. There's some things in between. But first of all, he talks about you are to pray, and we've already talked about it. You need to pray in times of what? Hardness, difficulty, trouble. Okay? Pray in times of hardness. It does imply that you may not pray in times of hardness. Matter of fact, what do many people do in times of hardness? Complain, gossip, get bitter, turn to something else, turn to vacations, turn to pleasure, turn to materialism. Instead of praying and going to God, you turn to some friend, some counselor, something else. The Bible's challenging you pray in times of hardness. Here's what the word affliction means, in case you want to know. The word affliction means to, it's during a time of problems. It has to do with a period of time. This is a time period. It's not like you have a time where, oh, my goodness, I'm going to have such a hard time. Well, I had a flat tire. Well, we can get that fixed. It can be fixed, you know, in less than 24 hours. 
Sometimes you go through times, I mean, it is a difficult time. You have a wayward child, and it is difficult. Your spouse has had an affair on you. They've left you heartbroken. They've gone out. That's a period of time that's hard. Amen? People are betraying you, talking about you, dividing up uh, everything that you're a part of, and it's a time period. It's not like a flat tire. This is a hard time. It means suffering in difficult circumstances. It means suffering in times of trouble. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 2.13, you are to endure hardness as a good soldier. You say, what is he talking about? He's talking about Christians that were suffering evil treatment. It means any kind of abuse that you're taking. People abuse you. They treat you wickedly. They distress you. They cause calamity. They persecute you. They, it's the idea that you are taking blows of abuse. One after the next, you're taking a beating of wrong treatment. And he says this, when you're fully feeling crushed, let him pray. Turn to God. Turn to God. Peter says, cast all your care upon him. Why? He cares for you. He cares for you. Take it to the Lord. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Don't grumble about it. Complain and blame everybody else about it. Abraham Lincoln said, I have oftentimes been driven to the throne of grace in prayer by the firm conviction, I have nowhere else to go. And friend, oftentimes that's what happens to us. Listen, trouble will do a couple things. We got to go quickly. Got four minutes. Trouble results oftentimes in two things. One, it can drive you away from God. And that is true. I would like nothing better than to say I got to... Uh, I'm like, it, like David said, I, I want to be an owl in the wilderness. I want to be an owl that flies into the desert. People want to escape. And oftentimes in their escape, they run from God. Second thing trouble can do, it can draw you close to God. That's the blessing of trouble. The blessing of trouble is that it can draw you to him. In our distress, we turned to the Lord. James, or I'm sorry, uh, Jonas said, uh, I, 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 in my fainting, I turned to the Lord. So it can draw you close to God. Let me say a few things about how God can respond to you in this type of praying. Number one, God can deliver you from the problem. This is one way God can choose. Now, this is the one we always choose, though, don't we? We always choose this one. I'm going to go, God, he's going to deliver. That means what? That means he takes it fully away. He annihilates it. It's done. There's Goliath. He takes his head off. Goliath is no more. I've been delivered. But what happens with Goliath's brothers? What if you don't take their heads off? You know, sometimes this, and this may not be the right word. I was trying to think of the right word for something I've always seen in the book of uh, Habakkuk where God's response to prayer is to kind of assure us in the problem. And by that, I mean how Habakkuk looked at a problem, the Babylonians, I, don't, I can't remember, no, it wasn't the Babylonians, the Assyrians, the, or no, it wasn't even the Assyrians, it was the Chaldeans, they are coming down into Israel, he sees it, and he cries out to God, and he says, why are you showing me this? Chapter 2, he says, uh, uh, Habakkuk, get up into that tower. And Habakkuk gets up in this high tower, and he sees life from God's point of view. He sees it from a different perspective. Now, the problem doesn't go away, but he sees it from God's point of view, and peace comes over him. He goes, oh, I got it. He wasn't delivered from the problem. The problem was still taking place, but he understood the purpose of the problem, and he was okay with it. That can happen to you in prayer. And the last thing that can happen to you is God can do this. He can just simply say, I'm going to sustain you through this thing. I'm going to get you through this. This is going to be rough. You're going to be beat. You're going to be abused. You're going to be mistreated. you got to endure this thing like a good soldier. We are going to war. I'm not stopping the war. He doesn't maybe show you the reason for the war. He just says, line up, follow, and off we go. And he does say, though, I will lift you up. I will strengthen you. Now, what do we do when times are good? We're to pray. So this is the last thing. Pray when things are good. Pray when things are good. Pray when times are good. And friend, the sad thing is... <laughs> Most people abandon God. 
They get the promotion. Everybody's healthy. The sun is out. It's going to be a beautiful weekend. What should we do this weekend? Let's go. Let's go. Let's abandon everything. Let's go. Let's go play. Things are good. Let's do something for the Lord. Things are good. Amen. It's summertime. Let's do it. We're challenging our praise team. Thing. It's summer. Let's do something. He says this. Why do we know this? Because he uses this. Is any merry? And this is what the word merry means. It means to be cheerful. It means to be happy. It means to be well in spirit. It means to be... Now here's I have a question for you. We close it. It's 8 o'clock. Everybody okay? You got 30 seconds. See that verse at the bottom of your page? I got a question for you. Do you think God wants you to be happy? Why? What's it say? Happy. Happy. It actually means happy, happy, happy. Yay. Happy are those people whose God is the what? The Lord. Who is your God? Huh? Who's your God? Is he the Lord? He number one? Politics your God? Sports your God? Religion, your God? Pleasure, your God? Work, your God? School, your God? Are these things important? Absolutely, they're important. But are they your God? No, the Bible says happy are those people. Yea, happy are those people whose God is Lord. You know what? God wants us to be happy. Now, Adrian Rogers, and Drew, you know this because you teach this in your class. Um, there's three things. We close on this. Do you know what? I want to put this to you because I want you to understand something. You are a trinity. God has created you the way that you are. And you just need to know, I do believe God wants us to be happy, guys. I know these are dark scriptures. They're dealing with prayer. But trust me, God wants us to be happy people. What testimony is it to the lost world if all we do is complain and grumble about onward Christian soldier and I'm a pilgrim and soldier off to war? It's not very attractive. But here's what I want you to know. You know, you know this. When your body's right, you're what? You're healthy. When your spirit is right, you're what? Holy. You're holy. What's your spirit? It's your emotions. It's your psyche. It's what, who you are. It's why people seek counselors, because they say, I'm emotionally distraught. My brain is torn. Again, James says, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Well, how do you cure double-mindedness? Well, he goes on and says in verse 23, be ye a doer of the word, not a hearer only. Be doers of the word and your brain will come together as one. You won't be split. Because God wants you to have a life that's pure. He wants you to have a mind that's together. And then lastly, he wants you to have this. He wants you to have a soul which is what? Which is right and happy. Right? Did I say that wrong? I think I said it right. I don't know. You got it. Healthy, holy, happy. Happy are those people whose God is the Lord. How do we get to know him in prayer? I hope you apply this to your life. It's meant to be an encouragement and strengthen you. And just always keep in mind the heart, the heart of endurance, it's prayer. Prayer is the heart of endurance. Any way you say it, pray, 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 pray. God bless you, and we'll see you back here on Sunday.